Let's start. I will uh, I try to cover a lot from uh, like uh, decomposing graphs and using this for algorithmic purposes. So uh, feel free to interrupt me uh, anytime. Uh, there is probably too much, but we, I mean, the beginning is not uh, less interesting than what is in the end. So I want to start with the probably the easiest structure when you uh, are facing a prime which is hard on general graphs. It's usually easy on trees. And but uh, just uh, take a, a quick example. So I will. Uh, I wanted to take dominating sets as an example, which is like NP hard on, on general graphs. If I don't put weights, it's really too easy, so I will put weights. So I want to find um, a subset of vertices. When I sum the weights, I want to minimize this, the number that I get. And I want to dominate all the vertices, meaning that the vertices that I will take, uh, their neighborhood will be the entire vertex set. So, uh, well, in general, this would be even harder than dominating sets, so that would be difficult on general graphs. On trees, we can solve this uh, bottom up. And there, there is just a finite number of states that we want to remember. For instance, what we can do is um, keep three solutions at every uh, subtree rooted at a vertex, and it will go up from the leaf to the root, and at the root will have the answer to our solution. So the, the three uh, lightest dominating sets that for our particular prime that we could uh, store would be the following. Uh, the ones that are containing the vertex at the root of your subtree, uh, the one not containing this vertex, and the one just dominating everything, but possibly disregarding the root of the subtree. So here the subtree is just one vertex. So if I take it, the best I can do is well just take it, and this is weight five. For the second kind, not taking it, I cannot dominate the entire uh, uh, subtree. So I put some symbol saying that this doesn't really match a feasible solution. And disregarding it, I could just take nothing, and this would be value zero. And then I can. Uh, go up this tree. So for instance, here, uh, taking uh, this vertex in the solution, I will now dominate uh, also this vertex. So I can complete that with the one disregarding the root of this subtree, which is, I have a solution of size 6. If I decide not to take it, I still have to dominate it. So I'll have to look at the solution here uh, containing the root and dominating the subtree, which is 5, and I get a 5 here. And disregarding it, I cannot do better than taking this vertex. So I can do the same, for instance, in, on, this part of, on this part of the, the tree. And I, when I reach this junction node here, so again, the same principle. Either I uh, decide to take this vertex, and now I can combine this with the solutions disregarding uh, dominating those uh, those nodes, so that would be com completing the solution with uh, solution five and one. So in total, I would get eight. If I consider things not uh, containing this vertex, but still dominating it, I can uh, the best I can do is six plus one, and I get seven. And now, if I disregard this, I have to dominate those things. So I'll look at this solution, which gives me six. So I can do this thing, and at the root, I will have the answer to my solution. Well, it's fairly restricted. We're just dealing with trees. But we can lift this up to graphs that, are, that look like trees. And uh, what do I mean by that is that you can, so you take your graph. Well, here it looks a bit like a tree. We'll try to make this formal. So we want to put a ver yeah, vertex subset to cover all the edges. So you see all the edges of my graph are completely contained in one of, at least one of those uh, subsets. And in addition, I want that when I look at a vertex, let's say this vertex here, 
Um, and here I represented uh, a tree, which is in one-to-one -one correspondence with those subsets. I want uh, all the vertices, uh, all the subsets containing this vertex to form a, a subtree, to form something connected here. So the most challenging vertex is this one. It's in three uh, subsets, the red, green, and blue one. So it would induce this subtree here. It's yeah. Any question on this? Okay, so, uh, well, now maybe you guessed. We can uh, lift what we did with trees to this structure. So let's take a slightly different problem. So we want to find a, a subset of maximum cardinality of vertices where pairs, if you take any pair of vertices, they are non adjacent in your graph. So now we'll do the same. So we'll look at <coughs> leaves and we'll try to go bottom up. So at leaves we have subsets like this. So here I can store all the possible uh, independent sets that I have here. So this is a click on, on four vertices. So I can decide not to take anything. And I will store that uh, this has value zero for, for my independent set. Or I can take basically uh, one of those four vertices. And in all four cases, I will get value one. Now if I go uh, up, um, I can again look at all the independent sets on the blue part. And I will combine them with the best that I have. Yeah, so I didn't say something important. So what we'll do, we'll try the same mimic the same thing as we saw with trees, meaning that uh, at each bag, we'll keep a best solution. Um, so for each possibility of intersecting the, the, the bag with an independent set, we'll keep the value of a best of a largest independent set, realizing exactly this pattern on the bag uh, when restricted to all the nodes that you see below it in, in this uh, tree structure. So in that case, uh, let's look at this. If you decide not to take anything here, you go one step back and you say, what was consistent with not taking any of those two vertices? And there were two answers. There were uh, this one and this one that are both value one. So you would actually not, for this particular uh, pattern, you would not need to remember if you take this or that. You just remember that this gives you two in the subtree. So again, we can uh, do the same here up to the point where we see some junction node. And uh, so at this point in, in the orange uh, subset, you would have those patterns. And now if I try to combine it uh, on the yellow subset, so I'll again look at all possible uh, independent sets uh, restricted to, to, to that bag. And uh, let's take one example how to, to deal with that. So if I look at this one where we take those two vertices. So remember that here, if we go one step back, this, the best was two. So I remember that here I, I have two. And not taking uh, this vertex, I had this, which was consistent, taking those two vertices with va overall value three. So I will remember two in this part three in that part, and there is no inter intersection here, so I don't need to subtract what I could uh, possibly double count. So it just, uh, yeah, plus those two, I, I get this six. So I can uh, do this thing here, up to the root, and at the root I look at the best pattern, and I have my uh, value of the largest independent set. So uh, there is a parameter uh, which is behind those three decompositions, which is called true width, which, uh, so you see here, uh, we'll come to the running time of what we did, but uh, the, the bottleneck seems to be the size of bags because we wanted to try all possible independent sets uh, on a bag. So the true width is precisely the largest uh, size of a bag in your over all the 
3D computation that, that you have, you try to minimize the largest batch size. Uh, so in the definition, you put a minus one so that trees have to reach one. So if you uh, think of the 3D composition of a tree, you would put in bags the edges of a tree to so have bags of size two. And for that to have uh, to reach one, we, we have this minus one on the back size. So yeah, the, the parameter was uh, discovered and rediscovered in the 70s and 80s. And then it, it became really central with uh, a series of paper, uh, papers sorry, uh, called Graph Miners by Robertson and Seymour. And also it's used for, uh, uh, to solve algori uh, algorithms faster. And uh, yeah, if we go to uh, the previous slide, what we did was really uh, the brute force over bags. So we, we were in exponential in uh, this parameter through it. And then it was linear in the number of bags. You might think of this can be uh, made linear in the number of vertices. So yeah, for bonded uh, through it, we get something linear, while the prime is in general np hard. Now I didn't tell you about computing this 3D computation. It seems challenging. You, you need the uh, those subsets and then this mapping of those subsets to, to a tree. Uh, well, it turns out that it's indeed challenging, but there are many, and it's NP-hard if you want uh, the exact value, but there are many uh, algorithms depending on the application that you want. So here, all those things are incomparable. They will be uh, sometimes better on the approximation ratio or on the running time, or you will have incomparable running time. So for instance, for our purpose here, if you want to claim this running time from scratch, not given the, the 3D completion, we would look at this result, giving not the exact uh, tree is bound, but within a factor of two, which will uh, here disappear in this ego. And uh, in to, to compute it, we need precisely this time. Um, yeah, so you, to, to illustrate that there is a lot of literature, there is this result refining now the, the constant that you get here, getting a slightly worse uh, approximation ratio. And uh, well, this is the best you can do in polynomial time as an approximation. So you get this uh, root of log through its, uh, as the best uh, known approximation ratio. So uh, despite that, there are many uh, like obvious questions that are open on trees, for instance, uh, whether it's still np horn on planar graph is unknown. So you might say, okay, but the like trees were not very generic and also looking like a tree is probably not generic. And you're right. Uh, we still get something uh, compared to what we can get on general graphs with graphs that do not have uh, trees bonded by a constant, but at least bonded by something uh, better than the trivial linear bond that you could get in putting all the vertices in one bag. So it's the, the case of uh, planar graphs and uh, graphs that also more generally graphs that you can embed on a, a surface or graph excluding a minor, if you know what that means. So here let's focus on planar graphs. Um, so we can represent them uh, in the plane without uh, crossings of edges. And it's known that uh, they have to reach root of n. But another way to, to say it, which is equivalent, is that you can recursively find the uh, balance separators of size root of n. So I can have, uh, I can find a subset of O of root of n vertices such that when I remove it, I break my graph into pieces, none of which is uh, larger than some uh, positive fraction, uh, uh, well, some fraction away from n. So let's say 2n over 3, or actually you could even put n over 2 there. So then you can uh, recurse, and you actually don't even need tr to compute through the compositions. You can do it on the fly. So if you compute the 3D composition and you do this direct programming that we saw, your, your complexity in uh, space will be the same as in time. You will have something also exponential. 
So here you, you don't even need that. So we can uh, get something which is in uh, polynomial space. Uh, the reason for let, let's try maximum independent set. So here you would try on the separator all the possible independent sets. Uh, let's say this one, this one. And for each, your algorithm would branch on choosing it. So in that case, you can remove well, all those vertices because you know what you will take from the solution. And also all the vertices that are uh, adjacent to what you picked. So you will get, oh, I messed it up. So let's say we take this one. You remove everything which is adjacent to those vertices, and you would get those things. And you know that uh, their sizes <coughs> is uh, no larger than 2n over 3. So you get this induction here. And uh, well, if you compute it, you get this, uh, this series, which, well, which is bounded by a constant. So actually, uh, you don't even uh, lose a logarithmic factor in the exponent. You really get the same as you would get uh, with doing dynamic programming. It would work for other problems. Uh, yeah, maybe let's mention that those uh, primes, they are unlikely to have such a running time in, in general graphs. That would uh, mean that you can solve uh, three sets in this running time, which is believed not to be the case. OK, and yeah, if you would, for instance, try to solve three coring, you would do the same. Try all possible three corings of uh, your separator. And then you would solve something more general. You want to remember that now those vertices, these vertex cannot have color red or blue. So you would put some list to, to this vertex saying that, well, now you can color it yellow, actually, if you want to three color it. So the list would tell you uh, uh, which color you can pick from. And uh, well, it would go the same. You'd get this uh, sub-exponential algorithm. <laughs> so, so far, uh, what we saw were on graphs with any questions so far? Uh, yeah, we, we saw examples where, uh, well, we saw just the example of trivets. Graphs with bounded trivets, they have a few edges that are sparse. Uh, if you have bounded trivets, you have uh, your average degree is also bounded. Uh, in the example of, of planar graphs, we had unbounded trivets, even if it was like bounded by root of n, and also it was a sparse case of it. So we didn't really deal with graphs that are very dense, a lot of edges, but simple in the sense to describe this, ver this graph. I don't need a lot of information. All the vertices are connected. So this is a click, and here we have two parts. Uh, they are all connected with each other. So you, you might imagine that those things, I mean, most primes should be easy on, on graphs like that. And uh, we would need something, a, a different uh, parameter that would encapsulate also uh, dense instances. So there is one. So I will not, I will postpone the definition of, of those uh, parameters. And actually, I will, uh, well, the first parameter to, to be defined was click widths in, in the 90s. And th there was no algorithm to approximate it or compute it, unlike for true -its. So later, uh, a parameter called rank width was introduced, which was morally equivalent to click width, but which was easier to compute. I will define none of them. Uh, at some point, I will define something yet uh, equivalent to those things. But we'll now uh, go through a different viewpoint. And uh, we'll find a fourth characterization of bounded click widths by uh, contraction sequences, which will now be like the, the thread of the rem reminder of the talk. So I will now, uh, so far, I mean, we had just seen uh, 3D computations, which was some static. Uh, structure on top of your graph. Now we'll go to something dynamic. So we'll modify the, the graph. 
But to, to motivate that, I will uh, present you another example of dense graph, possibly dense graph, or class of dense graphs, which is, uh, well, not as simple as clicks or, or by clicks, which are co-graphs. And they are, you can define them re uh, recursively by saying a single vertex is a co-graph. When you have two <coughs> co-graphs, you can make a new co-graph by taking the union and putting no edge whatsoever between them, or by putting all the edges between them. So uh, there is a natural, so even if it's uh, very far from a tree, because you can, uh, with this operation, make, make large click, there is natural tree structure uh, behind it, which is uh, basically how you define it. So at the leaves, you can put single vertices, and you can label nodes with the operation that you picked, either this digit union or this complete sum of putting all the edges. So now, with, with that in mind, you can, again, solve uh, this maximum independent set <coughs> problem. Now I will denote this by the, the value that you get by alpha of, of the graph. So how would you do that? You'd say, okay, on a single vertex, I have an independent set of size one. If I take the disjoint union, well, I ha don't have any edges by definition, so I can com combine an independent set here and there. So I would get this relation. And if I get a complete sum there, uh, I know that I will have to take only vertices there in my independent set or only vertices there. So I'll take the max between them. So if I change this tree uh, where I replace vertices by one, union by plus, and uh, those complete sum by max, and I just uh, compute what this tree means, at the root I will have the, the value of the independent set. So again, there is a tree structure behind it. And now I want to think of a different, uh, there are many ways of defining co-graphs. The first, uh, what we saw on the previous slide was the, like the most natural definition, but <coughs> you can think of it this way that will be relevant for our construction sequences. It's a, a class of graph where whenever you take a graph from the class, it has at least two vertices that are twins, meaning that they have, uh, uh, beside each, uh, themselves, they have the same neighborhood. So they can, there are two ways of being a twin. You have the same neighborhood. You can be uh, adjacent to your twin, and then you're a true twin, or non-adjacent, and then you're a false twin. Uh, so what does that uh, tell us? So I can find two twins. And I could contract them, meaning uh, make, let's say, those two vertices are twins. I now see as just one vertex. And contracting them and looking at their, the union of their edges, because they are twins, is exactly like deleting one of them. So uh, because you're close by just deleting vertices, you will again, uh, at the next step, find two twins that you can uh, contract. So let's, so this is an equivalent definition. Let's try to, again, get uh, an algorithm based on, on that definition. So we'll, so let's say, well, uh, this is my graph. I Probably I have edges, otherwise it's not very interesting, but I didn't really represent them. Initially, I will put uh, the value of a largest independent set contained in this vertex, which at the beginning doesn't mean too much because this is just one vertex, so yeah, I can take it. It's uh, an independent set of size one on its own. But I will contract things. So eventually, those uh, vertices will become subsets of vertices. And now it's meaningful to say what's the largest independent set uh, contained in my, in my subset. So uh, let's say we reach this point. And those values, they correspond again to the largest independent set contained in the subset corresponding to the ver those vertices. I have a co-graph, so I know that I can find two twins. So in that case, maybe those two vertices. Here, there are false twins. There is no edge. So the independent set that I have here and that I have there, I can combine them. So when I contract this, I, can, uh, I, mean, I will take the sum 
as we did previously. And here, uh, if I pick this pair, which is now a pair of true twins, three, four, I have to choose either I take vertices from here or from there in my independent set. So here I will take this four, so it's again this max. So we are doing exactly the same, but with a slightly different perspective uh, that will motivate now what happens if we have sort of this, but uh, we don't have <coughs> clear twins. So we have vertices um, that have a large common neighborhood and a few, uh, possibly a few private neighbors. Um, and to, to generate this, we'll uh, have to work not with, with graphs, but with graphs with, a special, uh, with special edges. So we'll have now three uh, possibilities between two vertices, uh, non-edge, an edge, or those red edges. OK, so we'll again later contract things. So you might think of those things as subsets of vertices. And then the non-edge means that there is no edge between th those two subsets. The edge means that there are all the edges between them. And uh, the red edge means that there is at least one edge and at least one non-edge. So we, we get something which is a, a bit blurry between those two vertices. So that's a, a trigraph. And what will be very relevant is, well, this thing when I remove actually the black edges. I focus just on the red edges, so this thing here. OK, so I said that I will contract. So in the case of the co-graph, the contraction was just deleting a vertex. Here it will be a bit more complicated. So let's say I want to contract to identify those two vertices. Um, so I will make one vertex out of them. and. Um, everything that was red towards one of them will remain red. Uh, everything that was black toward one but not toward the other will turn red. And things that are black towards both remain black, which is consistent <coughs> to my story that a black edge was all the edges between them. So I have still this black edge because I had all the black edge all the edges towards U and all the edges towards V. So we'll get this thing here. Um, and yeah, like in the co-graph case, I will go from my initial graph to a single vertex iterating this. So a contraction sequence will be you start from your graph and you pick a pair of vertices that you want to contract, those two. So here you see that there is an edge, but a non-edge, and there is an edge, but a non-edge. So I will get those two red edges forming, while G was linked to both, so you remain with this black edge here. So if we iterate this, we get a sequence of trigraph uh, ending in the, at the vertex. Uh, I will come back to this if I actually need those notations, but we could instead of actually performing the contractions, just record uh, the partitions. So keep, I keep my graph intact, and uh, I now have a part which contains both E and F. And there I have a part E and F, I have a part A and D, and so on. So what you see here would be the subset in your partition. You can also keep this uh, partition throughout. OK, so, uh, so yeah, well, why is it relevant? What we, uh, so we, we don't know. We, we can now define uh, many parameters, uh, we'll call reduce parameters, uh, based on what was happening in the red graph of the contraction sequence. So we'll say that take any parameter x, degree, or possibly through it. You put it here and you say that you, uh, class has bounded reduce this parameter. If uh, when you take a, a graph from your class, you can always find a contraction sequence. So what we saw previously, where all the red graphs 
have this parameter x bounded. So here are some examples. So if you put uh, as a parameter the degree, then you end up with something new that uh, we introduced, which is called twin weights. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. And you also can find things that were defined completely uh, differently. So if you take, uh, again, as parameter x, the maximum size of a connected component, you get this uh, click with thing that I will define later or something equivalent to it, but which is the dense equivalent of what we saw through it, and so on and so forth. And well, there are things that are uh, that we defined and we studied. There are things that we uh, we find those equ equivalences, and there are also parameters that could be in, yeah, that are possibly interesting. So those things here uh, give you something in between click widths and twin widths that you could explore. So, you, uh, but they always contain degree. The reason they always contain degree, either explicitly or implicitly in those parameters for those things to be bounded, the degree should be bounded, is that you always uh, have a contraction sequence where the red graph is a star. You just uh, contract everything on a single vertex. Uh, so you will just create red edges incident to it, but nothing else. So you will get a red graph, which is fairly simple, except its degree, it's a star, except uh, its degree is unbounded. So if you want something interesting, you, you need to have degree, uh, boundedness of degree being implicit or explicit. So we'll focus on this new thing of twin weights and also, uh, well, this equivalence here, and we'll generalize what we, we will generalize greatly what we saw at the beginning with true widths and maximum independent set to uh, Coursell theorems. So well, this is a visual uh, depiction of some of the previous slides. So that's, in that case, you see the red degree, the, the degree of the red graph is bounded. So things where you can maintain this throughout the whole contraction sequence will be bounded twin widths. Here, the connected component size, so I mean, pieces that are disconnected here. Uh, they are of size, we are bounded by four, so this would be uh, this parameter, which is the dense counterpart of our true bits. Uh, well, this I will skip. So finally, I will uh, give you something which is uh, equivalent to click width in the sense that it's called Boolean width. It's simpler and uh, classes have bounded Boolean widths, if and only if they have bounded click widths. So you might think of click widths as this thing, but just after that, we'll argue that it will be even more con convenient to think about our contraction sequences uh, and this component twin widths, which was uh, this reduced size of the comp uh, component. So you want a contraction sequence where the red graphs have uh, connected components of small size. So what is Boolean widths? You take a, a binary tree, and at the leaves, you put the vertices of your graph. And then you want that whenever you cut somewhere, let's say we cut here. So it gives me a, a partition of my vertex set in two parts, 1 to 8, and the rest, 9 to 32. I want that the number of neighborhoods of vertices here towards the exterior to be bounded by some value, which will be the link to the Boolean width. So let's see the exact, we'll uh, use the definition immediate, immediately. So if we have a bound on the number of neighborhoods towards the exterior, we'll find a subtree, which is just above this, uh, this bound of uh, different single vertex neighborhoods. So here I have uh, eight vertices, and I know that uh, the number of uh, different neighborhoods is strictly greater than eight. Yeah, it's strictly smaller than eight. So I'll have a collapse, I will have two vertices with the, the exact same uh, vertices outside. So there are not twins because they can differ. So let's say two and six. 
See, they have exactly the same neighborhood outside. They are not twins because they can dif their neighborhood can differ on, on this part. But for me, it will be fine. I will contract those vertices. Yeah, so we, we are trying to, to show that if you have bonded Boolean widths, we can find a contraction sequence where uh, the red graph has a component of bonded size. So here, indeed, I get something. Uh, the red component of this part is trapped within this subtree because there is no red edge crossing this edge of the tree, meaning that there is no red edge between, I didn't create any red edge between a vertex here and a vertex there. So because I, I picked my tree to be slightly larger than the number of neighborhoods, but also small, I, I have a bond in the connected size, which is the total uh, size of this subtree that I took, which I, I took to be 2D. So this would be one direction of uh, the equivalent that I claimed. The other is uh, like basically reversing what did there. I will not do, but the, the, the idea is now we have um, a contraction sequence. And we will try to build this, this binary tree layout where, uh, again, when you were uh, taking any uh, edge of of the tree, the number of different neighborhoods from one side to the extra was small. So what you do is you put close together in the tree uh, vertices that correspond to the same uh, connected component in the red graph. And now you can forget about uh, Boolean widths and we'll just work with contraction sequences. Any question? Let's see what time I have. Mm. Okay, so, um, so we'll try to, uh, to see if it's helpful algorithmically. So we'll uh, try to solve three coloring, which is again NP hard, faster when we're given uh, a contraction sequence where the red graph has connected components of bounded size. So, yeah, I just fast forward to one point uh, in, the, in the contraction process. Uh, what I will actually record is on my subset, I want to, uh, sorry, on my red connected components, so you see here I have three of them. Um, I will look at all the possible profiles of coloring in the following sense. Um, so this will mean that there is, so those subsets, they contain possibly many vertices. So the fact that I have this profile of a three coloring means that there is a proper three coloring, meaning that they are not putting the same color to adjacent vertices, where all the vertices from this part would get only color from two and three, and at least one would get two, at least one would get three. All those vertices would get uh, color one, and all those vertices would get color two. So those components, they have size bounded by, uh, by my parameter, by D. So it's fine to the number of uh, profiles is bounded by an exponential bound by the number of uh, subsets minus the empty set of uh, one to three, so seven to, to the D. Um, so this is one possible profile, this would be another profile. You see that uh, here I have some vertices color two, and also here I have ver all the vertices color two. And there seems to be an edge, but this is a red edge, meaning that this is not incompatible. Only all the vertices color two here, they will be non adjacent to those, this part here. While well, here I have a black edge, so it's totally different. Now I have all the edges. So for this to be a possible profile, in particular, this set and this set of colors should be disjoint. And yeah, the, the mapping to colors is, uh, well, one is red, two is blue, and green is, is three. Uh, so okay, this is another profile. 
Now, the next, let's say the next contraction is to contract those two subsets. And this will uh, unite those three components into one. Because now uh, I will have those edges connecting C1 and C2. And I will create a red edge towards C3. Because it's adjacent in black, but not here. So what I will do to update all the possible uh, compatible uh, profiles of coloring is I will try uh, to, to match the 7 to the D uh, possible uh, profiles here with there and there. So this is a triple of, of profiles. And I will look if it's compatible or not. Looking if it's compatible or not is just looking at the black edges, because they cannot be red edges by definition between those things, and just checking that the subsets are, are disjoint. So it's the case here, 1, 2, uh, two and 1, 3, 2, 3, and 1 and 2, 3. So this will uh, give me this profile, where here I use all the colors now, because I yeah, unify those two sets. And I will remember that this is possible. There is a proper way of coloring my graph realizing this profile. An example where it would not work, uh, here you see I colored 2 and 3. I have a black edge towards 3. So there will be a conflict between those things. So here this I would dis uh, disallow. So I will not record this uh, as a solution for the new component C. So what we did initially was we had the graph with uh, all the vertices, all the parts being single uh, vertices. So initially we can just say for each vertex there are three ways of coloring it, putting color 1, 2, and 3. So I can initialize things like this. And we saw that the update was uh, exponential in, in uh, my parameter d. But then we made, uh, we were linear uh, because we had n contractions. So we get something uh, which is like our first algorithm with, with true bits and maximum independent set. We get something single exponential and linear here. While we are on a super class of bounded true bits, so bounded click width is more general than bounded true bits. And you see that uh, we chose three colorings, but uh, maybe some other primes would have worked. So I, uh, indeed, they work. So uh, there is this framework um, of defining problems as sentences, so either of first order or uh, monadic second order. So I will define this by example. But first order, you quantify over vertices. And second order, you quantify over, you can also quantify over sets of vertices. So this would be an example of something first order. Uh, so here I use the convention that with lowercase, those are vertices. So I'm asking whether there are k vertices such that for every vertex of my graph, either it's one of those k vertices or it's adjacent. So yeah, I can, I have only one uh, predicate in my vocabulary, the edge set. So I can talk about the edges or this vertex is adjacent to one of those vertices. So this is what we saw at the very first slide. It's this dominating set problem. K dominating set, I want a dominating set precisely of size K. Uh, well, you can define more things. So this would be this uh, K independent set. You want K vertices. And they should be dis distinct and non-adjacent. But you can also, so this would be two examples of first order logic. You can also ask for questions in MSO. So now you can quantify over uh, high order uh, predicates, but they should be unary. So meaning uh, you have you can quantify over sets basically. So uh, do I have three sets which are uh, these joints, and if uh, two were two vertices have the same color, they are non-adjacent, so this would be this three coloring, and so on and so forth. So there are many primes that you can express in this framework. And uh, so Coursera theorem is that um, 
on this more general MSO model checking, you, you can solve uh, in linear time every problem of this form when you have a witness that the click width is bounded. So for us that the component to units is bounded. So here you get a very large function of the sentence, uh, the quantifier rank of your sentence, and the, the bound on of click widths or component to units. So I'm afraid I won't have time to to uh, <coughs> go through through a sketch of proof, but it's basically what we did with the three coherings, except we'll remember a lot more of information. Uh, we were just remembering profiles of three, uh, three coherings here. We will remember all the sentences up to some uh, alternation of quantifiers, uh, some nestedness of quantifiers that are satisfied by uh, my red components. So this is, uh, <coughs> yeah, but conceptually it's exactly the same. So you could, and we, we did that, you could reprove the course of you, you get a proof which is not very, uh, and there are many proofs of this, and uh, you get something which is not really extremely different, but maybe simpler in the sense that component twin units, once you're a bit familiar with contraction sequences is easier. I didn't define click widths, but you have different kinds of operations in click widths, while here you just have uh, contractions. So I will uh, skip that so that I can tell you a bit about twin widths. So now we move to the red graph having uh, uh, component size bounded to just the de uh, its degree is bounded. So you get something strictly more general. Uh, many slides. Uh, okay, and the first thing that I will argue is that we have something strictly more general. So this is an example of a graph with unbounded true widths, unbounded click widths. So if you take a root of n by root of n grid like this, the, the true widths is root of n and also the click widths is order root of n. While the twin widths is a constant, it's bounded by four. So even the two units of this trigraph is four. So what we do is we can contract those two vertices. We get this trigraph. Uh, so this uh, red, this edge turns red because this was non adjacent And then we contract this edge. We get that and we reach that point. And we can iterate this up to uh, the point where we'd have just one red pass and we could contract the, the red pass from one to point to another. So we get twin widths at most four, but as I said, the, the click width is bounded. Another example, very different, where true widths and click widths are unbounded, is you take any graph on n vertices and you subdivide uh, its edges enough time, meaning at least two log n times, then the twins drop to being at most four. So if you take the, just the one subdivision of any graph, you'd have unbounded twins, but if you subdivide more the edges, I may, I, maybe I should say what subdivide means. So you, you have an edge, to, to subdivide it, you just put a vertex in between. So here we want to put at least two log n of them. But if I uh, ignore those things that are not conveying too much information, the, the graph on those big vertices it's arbitrarily complicated. I started from any graph. So why the, the two units is bounded? So we'll, show, we'll put the vertices at the leaves of a tree, which is virtual. So I will add those vertices and those red edges. And I will show that this super trigraph has two units at most four. So uh, I didn't say that, but if you think about it, if you take uh, an induced subgraph, so something from your graph where you just, uh, you're just allowed to remove vertices, uh, the twin widths cannot increase. So you'd get uh, twin width which is at most the twin of your initial graph. So if we can show <coughs> twin at most four for, for this, we will show twin at most four for the initial graph that I put here without putting the edges at this point. And now we consider an edge. So an edge, Ah, yeah, I didn't say, I don't put all the vertices of my graph, I put all the real vertices, all the vertices 
that are not part of this subdivision. So now my graph uh, looks like this. Maybe there was initially an edge between 3 and 11, and then I subdivided this. So here I have plenty of vertices of this subdivision. So what I do first is to make sure that uh, this length is exactly the length of the path in the tree from 3 to 11. So in that case, I have to go to the root. So it's probably 7. So we'll contract in the middle, let's say. Intro I mean, I will uh, really introduce those red edges, but it won't be a problem. And now this has exactly the length of this. So what I can do is now contract those pair of vertices that have the same color. So if I contract those two things, I get this red edge, and this vertex has red degree 4. It's fine. Now I can contract this and that. And you see that I'm zipping the subdivided edge uh, on, its, uh, on the path on the tree between those two vertices. So when I'm done with this process, I didn't uh, create more red edges incident to 3 and 11 than those two that I consider already present. So the effect is just to remove the subdivision. So it's like I rem remove this edge. So we'll go through the next edge and do this principle again. And eventually I will get this, this tree. And uh, the tree has bonded to it, so you can uh, contract from the leaves. You can contract those things, those things those things, those things, and then you get a tree with uh, heights one less. Uh, maybe I should stop here. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, I just, yeah, it's quite general, the classes of bonded twin units, and I just skip that uh, with component twin units, you could solve efficiently um, MSO model checking, monad hexagonal order model checking. Here you cannot because you uh, contain planar graphs. So for instance, three coloring is uh, the difficult prime on, on planar graphs. So you cannot hope to, to solve uh, MSO model checking, but you can solve FO model checking. And this is using the same trick as what we saw uh, for, uh, for three coloring and component units uh, in a different context of k-independent set. So, uh, and you can leave this, yeah, as I said, to FML checking with the caveat that you need a contraction sequence. So thank you for your attention. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes. Yeah. Oui, euh, une question très générale. Un certain nombre de décompositions, comme la Trimis par exemple, ont été généralisées aux hypergraphes, genre l'hypertrimis, ouais. fractional decomposition. Et est-ce qu'il y a une. Est-ce que tu sens qu'il y a une possibilité d'aller dans ce sens-là Oui, c'est une très bonne question. Donc, so la question était est-ce uh, qu'il y a une généralisation de of, of width à uh, higher arity structures Donc, so not binary structures like graphs, mais peut-être ternary structures So it's an excellent question, and we've been thinking about it. So there are some properties that you have uh, for twin units. I'm, I, yeah, I didn't really go through them, but there are many properties that you have in the binary case. And you will, uh, there won't be a wonderful notion for ternary structures that will keep all of them. So you have possibly You have not just one generalization, but plenty, depending on what you want to keep, either alg algorithms or uh, more structural things. But uh, yeah, as far as we can tell, there won't be a unique, uh, very neat uh, generalization to even ternary relations. Yeah. Donc, beaucoup de travaux ont exploité en fait, des décompositions historiquement pour euh, traiter des modèles graphiques au sens large. Bon, par modèle graphique, modèle de base, je vais par exemple parler de SAT ou alors euh, de CSP, dans le cas binaire. Bon, on a des problèmes qui vont être euh, traitables 
sous l'hypothèse de largeur bornée. Et là, est-ce que l'on peut envisager la Twin Wheels pour capter des bonnes propriétés sur les modèles graphiques bon, Je dis CSP, binaire, ouais. CSP, d'arrêté quelconque, SAT, au-delà, euh, réseau bayésien, euh, réseau de fonction de coût, généralise euh, ces différents modèles. Est-ce qu'avec la Twin Wheels, on pourrait avoir euh, des propriétés similaires Yeah, so again, very good question. So the, the question is whether you can use twin weights or like uh, true weights you used to, to solve CSPs or um, SAT solving or things that I'm even less familiar with. Uh, so the, yeah, it's, a, it's an avenue. The, the thing to have in mind is the, the two examples of bonded twin weights that I presented. So now you have to be aware that you're containing very general structures like grids where many CSPs will be already difficult if you allow for grids and uh, maybe even worse you contain it's not a topological notion so you contain anything as long as you subdivide things uh, sufficiently many times so if you can propagate any problem where you can uh, easily propagate the information you will uh, not really get any hope for using twin widths. And really, algorithmically, the, the counterexample to this kind of thing is considering something local, like a first-order logic, where solutions will live locally somewhere. So it's, those questions are of the form, uh, do I have k vertices satisfying something? And not do I have an, a, a global truth assignment to a CSP or to, to SAT? Yeah. Si j'ai bien compris, quand, par exemple, effectivement, là, tu parlais des grilles, yeah. euh, en fait, c'est un problème difficile au niveau CSP binaire. Yeah. Euh, euh, J'avais le sentiment que c'était peut-être difficile d'exploiter. Oui, oui, c'est le cas. Bien. Euh, une question un peu entre les deux, peut-être. Donc, à, à tout le monde, cas, on pense à n'importe quel droit euh, comme une heure. Uh, not a silly question, it's a very good question again. So there, uh, about this twin is four, so there was a, the example of the grid and the subdivision. Uh, we cannot show that, so we can show twin is at most four. It's, we believe strongly that the twin is exactly four. And same for the grids. And uh, indeed, there could be really something uh, different from twin is three and four. So it's. So, so something I didn't mention, so we have, uh, well, here there is a caveat of we need the contraction sequence. In general, how to compute it, we don't know, even to approximate it. We know that the prime is, uh, is NP, uh, it's NP complete to decide if the twins is at most four. So it's uh, again this four. And uh, yeah, twin is three could uh, be sub yeah, substantially easier so for instance, it could be that um, if you have twin widths at most three and you're sparse, in the sense you don't have large biclic, those things were two parts were fully adjacent, then you could uh, collapse to bonded true widths, for instance. So this is a conjecture that we cannot disprove or prove. So yeah, the, the Definitely, there is something. Uh, so, twin is four is for sure very complicated. Twin is three at most three could be much simpler. Yeah. Uh, given a, a graph, and the known uh, bound on the, on the twin width, can you compute the uh, sequence? Uh, there are a, a bound of the complexity to compute the sequence. If you know exactly the the bound, yes. or. No, it would be exact. Uh, it would be the, s the same thing uh, because you can uh, you can guess the, the the bound by trying all the values from zero to n. So it's as difficult when you know the exact bounds as to find the. Yeah. So we we don't know how to uh, yeah, compute it. Uh, let yeah, approximate it. Let alone compute it. Yeah. <coughs> But you say that one quiz is approximate, yeah. it's because there is a exponential dependency between yeah. the two. <coughs> is there uh, something like this for uh, two quiz? Uh, something that can be uh, maybe much larger than two quiz, but that is approximate. 
Yeah, we we, we hope, uh, but yeah, we, we don't have that at the moment. And uh, so there are things that could seem uh, uh, yeah, the, we we don't really have candidates, and uh, the prime is really the, those subdivisions. We need something that can detect. Yeah, so something more problematic is the subdivisions. If you put logarithmic many vertices here, you get off bounded units. But also, if you put sub logarithmic, you still have unbounded units. So your notion should uh, really capture something uh, strange, like the the count on on the subdivision. And for that reason, we. We don't have uh, something like uh, like rank quiz is for click quiz. Thank you. Maybe you can thank again. Thank you.